Now, to finalize the introduction, we discuss how the series, to whom it's addressed, how we'll be discussing things, and what the contents will be. The series, as was mentioned uh, in general, is addressed to Muslims in general, is addressed to impartial people, inquiring about Islam. It's addressed to seekers of, tr of truth. One of the splendid names of our creator is the truth, al-haq. If you are a person deep inside right now, listening to this lecture, seeking the truth, do know that you are seeking our creator. It's also addressed to people with fundamental questions. Where did I come from? Meaning, how did I come to exist? Meaning, was I an amoeba? And then by evolution became a man? Or is there something else to how I came to exist? The first issue provides no meaning to my existence. As the uh, idolaters during the time of the prophets, used to, of our prophets used to say, it's only vaginas pushing and earth swallowing. That's what it is. That's one view. The other view is very deep, and very soon we'll come to it in the next lecture. Don't worry. Why are we here? What's the purpose? OK, there's a God. He created me. Why? There was no God. Why? This question, why am I here, uh, when it's sincerely asked in your heart, it's because you already are contemplating the notion of the possibility of the existence of the Creator. The person not accepting to give any thought to the existence of the Creator would not have any problem asking himself, why am I here? Oh, I'm, uh, there's no reason why he's here. The reason why he's here is because of a vagina that pushed him, and soon the earth will swallow him. There's, there's no reason. No spiritual, no ethical, no, sorry, no human reason. Other important questions that we try to answer that really are of essence to us the speaker here, I have not been always with my same views today. I most probably have been, from your views, sharing them deeply at one time in my life. So I'm not coming to tell you, hey, I'm the, the good one, listen to me. I'm just saying that we have the same makeup. My humanity is the same as yours. My mental process is approximately the same as yours. My ego is the same as yours. And I have had, therefore, many of the thoughts that you have. I'm not saying you're bad, you're wrong, but I'm saying I have also been exposed to other stuff and experienced them. So the basic questions that came to my mind, to your mind, if there's a God, what's this about heaven and hell? Why does he allow us to do sins in the first place? Huh? Great, most merciful, powerful. Hey, he can create me not doing sins and then to heaven. Why coming to earth? Why not going to heaven? Why not create me as a cherub in heaven enjoying my life? Shouldn't he do the best for us, the most merciful? Shouldn't he do the best for us? Why allow all that suffering? Earthquakes, terrorists. And they, again, people from religions mention predestination. Wow, he predestined me to do bad things. 
He could have created me as a good person and then take me to heaven. Because he created me as a bad person. That's another issue that will be answered, that comes to my mind, to your mind. If you ever remember when you were making a puzzle, when you're putting a puzzle together, okay, you got the thousand of pieces, it's not working, not working. There are times when you put the right piece, then everything fits. The issue is not a superiority from the speaker to you. It's everything fit for others. When I looked at it, it fit completely for me. There would be no more disagreements, no more contradictions. When you get the piece of the puzzle in the right place, then you say, fine, I am here to watch the blessing of God on whoever will get that piece of puzzle in its right place. We will concentrate on displaying, as said before, the logical, the moral, the psychological, and the spiritual aspects of Islam. This seems to be a very, very daunting task, but it will be a delight that I look forward to from God to me and to you. Please be patient with my sentences, just like I was patient many times when one of my teachers would read a book, I would be understanding what the person is saying, just like your patient when your beloved, there's a beloved person in your life speaks, and the beloved person misuses a word. You don't stop the word for that. You follow him. You don't stop him. You fill in the voids. You correct it. I'm not saying if I'm saying black instead of white, then correct it for me, you know. I'm saying my small semantic problems, please correct them for me. Don't hang on those. The issue is more important than that. One person once this, uh, I read that was criticizing one of the greatest scholars of Islam, who we are going to talk about soon, called Imam al-Ghazali, called the, authority, the authoritative argument of Islam. That's how they called him. He was in a time where debates had to be performed by him, and he provided outstandingly great arguments in many fields. And he wrote beautiful, uh, a beautiful um, uh, magnum opus of his life is the revival of religious sciences in four or five volumes, containing the summary of his perception and the perceptions of many Sufi mystics about Islam and the morals. And I read the criticism that, hey, his language is a little weak at some places. And I read the answer, but Imam Ghazali's purpose was not to present a literary masterpiece in the Arabic language. Although, by the way, the beauty of the language that he's using in the book is outstanding. Um, in our company, we have a company, a training company. In the first years of the company, we'll be establishing something, adding a new feature to our company. We always noticed each time we add a new feature, there's new criticism that comes up. So perfection is only to God. I am the proof of that. The sincere listener seeking for truth, you are seeking something very important. Please fill in the voids when it's reasonable to fill them. When not, then throw my words away. Again, also, even if my words are wrong, are they all wrong? We say in Islam, to every scholar, there's a mistake. I cannot imagine talking about this subject with no mistakes. But they say, in contrast, when talking about teachers and students in moral education, in moral training in Islam, the fault of the teacher is stronger than the correct thought of the students. Why? Because the teacher has the foundation 
So you can say, for example, 99% or 95% of what he says is correct. His style overall would work. You would take a person as a guide across the deserts or across the forest, knowing he's human and he's fallible and he might make mistakes, if you know he's a very good expert. Making a mistake on the road is expected. You would not accept to take a person who doesn't know the field. I hope that was explained adequately. The contents of the series, the word spirit of Islam is very general. Let's explain how we're going to go about it. But before that, we need to mention an important hadith that sums up many issues of Islam. Uh, with a little comment about this wonderful hadith. The companions, uh, I do not have the name of the companion. It could most probably be uh, Omar ibn Khattab said, we were sitting one day with the Prophet, peace be upon him. So listen to this hadith, listen to the level of details that was mentioned. Again, not as a uh, despising other books. It's just showing the value of this level of detail. We were sitting one day with the Prophet, peace be upon him, when a foreign strange man, stranger man, came up upon us. Now watch out. They're sitting in the city. A strange man came upon us that none of us knew. So we're not talking about a city like New York with 5 million people. We're talking about Medina. A guy comes in. Nobody knew him. So he's a traveler. He said with white clothes, clean with no signs of travel, sat down, his knees facing the knees of the Prophet. So you have a person here and a person coming, sitting, facing him, knee to knee, put his hands on his thighs. I cannot tell, was it his thighs or the size of the Prophet? You can see you can almost see it, and it's nice. And he said, Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The Prophet answers, Islam is to witness that, is, that there is only one worthy of worship, Allah, or that no one is worthy of worship but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. To establish prayer, give due charity, fast Ramadan, and perform pilgrimage, which is called Hajj, if you're able to. He said, you're right. The companion says, we wondered, how would he be coming, asking, and then telling him, you're right. Then he asked, tell me about belief. The Prophet, peace be upon him, answered, that you believe in Allah, the Arabic name for creator. By the way, there's a lot of red herrings and a lot of smoke screens. Uh, Allah, using the name of Allah, trying to alienate people against Islam. Allah is the Arabic name of the creator. The closest to it is the only words used in the Bible. Okay? That will be, hopefully, in another session, another lecture, if necessary. Remember what's related about Jesus on the cross. Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. Eloi, Eloi, Elahi, my God, Elah. That's Arabic also. Elahi, my Elah, my God, my Lord, Allah. So the answer of the, the, answer of the prophet was, that's concerning, tell me about belief. That you believe in Allah, his angels, meaning that they exist, his books, meaning to Muslims, to Christians, to Jews, and other nations, messengers, and the last day, and believe in preordination, whether good or bad, from Allah. Oh, that will be a major topic to discuss 
we will cover it too. The person answered, correct. And Omar says, we kept wondering how come he's asking and then saying correct, confirming him. He said, tell me about excelling. In Arabic, it's called ihsan. The prophet answered, please pay attention, it's beautiful, that you worship God, Allah, that you worship God as if you're seeing him. And if you don't see him, that he's seeing you. This is a wonderful hadith, the, the last part here. Wonderful. Try it out. When you want to pray God, when you want to ask him, when you want to talk to him, remember the two pivots here. Try to do it as if you're seeing him. If you can't, at least that he's seeing you. I'll give you an example. On the second level, for the person who can't always connect with God as if he's seeing him. This is, this is, requires more success. The other one is, fine, then do it as if he's seeing you. Notice that you're driving now in a city where policemen are very fussy, would hold you to the letter of everything in the book. And you notice that you just passed a police car. And you're going down him. And the speed is X, and your speed is X. The speed limit is X, and your speed is X. And the police car is now behind you. You don't, you don't see it in your mirror. You keep driving, and you know. You keep in mind that he's watching you. Easy. That's just an example to show me and you how that can be achieved. When you want to pray to God, whatever you do with God, meaning in trying to communicate, if you don't succeed in doing it as if you're seeing him, and there's a lot of depth in the first part, then it is easy for you to do it, knowing that he's seeing me, and you can sustain that. Now, the depth that I mentioned concerning the first part to worship God as if you're seeing him is because it has two levels, two possibilities. To worship him as if you're seeing him means almost you're seeing him. The other meaning is if you're talking to the king as if you're seeing him, you're going to be very polite, you're going to be very nice, you're going to be very correct in your talk, you're going to be... So that meaning here is when you worship God, you should do it as if you're seeing him. What will be then your manners? What will be then your sincerity? That's how you should be worshiping God. That is excelling. By the way, it applies to prayer. It applies to everything. For the Muslim, religion is all life. Walking in the street carries a responsibility. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said in another hadith, picking a piece of dirt from the road is a good deed. It's a religious thing. So in all life, another hadith from the Prophet, he said, Allah has prescribed ihsan, excellence on everything. On every action, you're required to do it well. These things appeal to the heart. A correct religion appeals to the heart. Again, the person told the Prophet, correct. Uh, then uh, the, this person asked another question about the last day and its signs, etc. They're not important here. What's important here is the, uh, uh, the import of this hadith on the contents of the series here. But a very important comment has to be made here. When the person left, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, do you know who that was? They said, no. He said, this is the angel Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. His questions were to teach you and us. By the way, for people who don't believe in miracles, yet put that aside. For people who believe in the possibility of miracles, an important point here has to be made. 
There was no jubilation. Oh, Gabriel came all over the city, people running. No. The Muslims, what they were perceiving from the actions of the Prophet, you will know when you read his life, will be almost continuous miracles. Knowing that the angel Gabriel came was for them nothing. They knew that he was always the angel providing the revelation. For Muslims, miracles are not the cause for belief. The cause for belief of Muslims was the social correctness of the message, the rationality of the message, and the spirituality that they were seeing firsthand and that Muslims keep seeing until today when they meet persons who have this connected chain to the Prophet. You may not hear this in many lectures, but it is a predominant uh, assertion among the most famous Muslim scholars of the world. Just because this is a spiritual, spiritually inclined series, we are mentioning it. I have read, I have heard in some uh, uh, attempts to attack Islam, um, uh, Muslims have no miracles in Islam. Muhammad did not perform any miracle. There's a book this thick here available, counting the miracles of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And yet, when a Muslim is following his religion, when a Muslim is breathtaken by issues of Islam, it's not the miracles. The miracles in Islam are, again, the impact in our family life, personal life, social life, and rationality. The uh, physical miracles exist. Muslims don't give them a lot of weight for belief. Again, what I can say to summarize it is, Muslim scholars, when they mention the miracles of the Prophet, mention them as a matter of fact, not in the all miraculous way. Okay? And because Muslim scholars insist, do not be misled by unusual feats, by a person who flies, a mosquito can fly, the devil can, can transport from here to there, a fish can go in the water. If you want to be impressed, be impressed by the good deeds of the person, whether he can be a good example, ethically and morally. That's what you should be looking for. The highest spiritual persons in Islam have always shied away from requesting uh, semi-miracles in their life. They consider it as a frivolous demand of the ego, and they shy away from it. They want semi-miraculous issues in the way that they can conform to the prophet. If that happens in an unusual excellence, they will accept that as being a semi-miracle. As such, based on this hadith, this series will contain the discussion about belief, the five pillars of Islam, which is prayer, giving poor money, fasting, etc. Uh, the first one being the uh, declaration of, uh, of faith. It would also include the morals, ethics, um, which pertain to the last section of the hadith, tell me about excelling. And there will also probably be miscellaneous issues pertaining to logic, common sense, as the need will arise. Uh, there has been many books written on the subject of the spirit of Islam. Uh, one uh, book dear to me uh, was written by Tabbara uh, that I like to mention. It was given to me as a gift when I first got married. I was uh, charmed by the simple style that it had and yet the depth and of its content and the success in conveying what he wanted to convey. Uh, if you feel this is a little tough here, uh, 
it's going to get easier as we go along. But uh, this person, uh, uh, Tabara, had a great book. So the first concept of this series of lecture was uh, inspired by my memories of his book. It does not mean at all that this is uh, based on his book. But if you can buy the book, it's from the Library du Liban, from uh, Lebanon. Hopefully, uh, we may be able to add it uh, to our website, mohadith.org. So this is not a translation of the book. This is not based on the book. It is inspired by the beautiful uh, approach that he had, concentrating whenever he's moving in discussing the topics that I mentioned, belief, pillars of Islam, morals, etc., concentrating, when possible, on bringing up the spiritual uh, facet of Islam. To conclude this introduction, I have decided to do, with the help of Allah, at the end of each session, to finish it with a supplication from the Prophet. The supplications of the Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, describe his approach to God, his way of talking to God, and his te as also teaching us how to convey to God. Many are, are outstandingly beautiful supplications. Muslims enjoy them through so dearly, so why not finish everyone with a taste of one of these supplications? This is an authentic hadith according to Al-Hakim. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that the Jesus, son of Mary, used to teach his companions, if one of you had a debt of a mountain of gold and prayed Allah with this supplication, he will fulfill it for him. Here's a supplication. O oh Allah, who alleviates the worry, who clears the distress, who answers the prayers of the direly in need, O oh merciful of this world and the hereafter, and their compassionate. You're the one to be merciful to me. So grant me a mercy with which you will suffice me from any other's mercy. In another hadith, uh, with a small variation, grant me a mercy today. Uh, of course, the Arabic is so beautiful also. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalamu alaikum.